Hi, everyone. Welcome to our next webinar on digitizing financial services to MSMEs, which is the second session in BFC's digitization webinar series presented to you over the course of two months. In our last Ask BFC webinar, two weeks ago, we looked at how we get started with digital transformation and also mostly at strategic aspects. Today, we will be looking at product development, digitizing financial services, delivery channels, and the business process design. And I look forward to a good discussion today. For this, I'm glad to introduce to you three very experienced practitioners, which are with me now in the room. Starting from Charlene bachmann Wolzberger, who is a digital transformation expert. She's currently working at Finance in Motion, which you know, most of you is a leading impact asset management firm. And uh, throughout the last 10 years, Charlene's digital experience uh, stretched over Latin America, Asia Pacific, Africa, and Europe. And she has been doing this from the perspective of a software company. So that is the perspective Charlene brings in. Charlene, welcome. And thank you for making the time to be connected with us from Frankfurt. Thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure. And good morning, everyone. Good. Our second speaker is Paul Wild, who is an international banking consultant. He is currently working on a European investment bank funded SME and youth banking project at EG Bank, which is an uh, Egypt based company engaged in the provision of corporate financial uh, services in the retail investment banking area. And before embarking on his consulting career, 20 years ago, Paul has worked in globally active banks as a corporate banker. Paul, welcome to our session. You are connected from Cairo with us. Mahaban from Cairo. Good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Great. And last but not least, I welcome Dmitry Bobriev, who is a senior MSME finance consultant at BFC. He has over six years of project implementation experience, including as a project manager in a consulting function, and also uh, he has been working at leading banks in the Ukraine before in, uh, in the field of MSME finance. And his global experience includes Eastern Europe, Caucasus, and South Asia. Thank you very much, Dimitro, for being with us today. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, and uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Great. So my name, you know me already, Michael Kortenbusch. I'm the Managing Director of Business Finance Consulting. We'll be moderating this session for you, and I'm connected with you from Zurich. All right, and with this, we can move already to the next slide, which shows a bit of our agenda. So similar to the last session, we have divided our theme today, services, digitized financial services to MSMEs into three blocks, which you can see here on the screen. So we'll go one after the other. And the good thing today is that we will under each block present a short showcase starting from block one, launching an invoice financing app in Myanmar presented by Paul. Under the second block, business process re-engineering, we will hear from Dimitro, loan origination system launch. And finally, under the third block, piloting digitized financial services, we'll hear from Charlene about a digital monitoring application. Good, and around those mini showcases, we will have a lot of questions. But before we start, we start sweating ourselves we want you the audience connected to us from more than 44 countries today to inform us where you stand with the digitization of financial services at your institutions and for this we have a few questions to you which we will go over the webinar we're starting with the first one reading this to you which of the following areas are driving digital transformation in your institution they can all be selected multiple choice so you see the answers here. Please start answering this and why this is running. I'd like you to remind that we have three channels, how you can reach us to ask your questions during the webinar, but all the time. So first do our corporate website. You can um, go there and basically ask us questions and we will pick them up and answer. Second, you can write us an email directly. And uh, the details of the website, the emails, the support team are now will post in the comment section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And third, uh, you can write us during the session 
in the question and answer window at the bottom of your screen. And I much hope you will make a lot of use of that. We will try, I can't promise, but we'll try to answer your questions during the session. Good, and with this, we see already um, the results coming in. I think probably we can already conclude the poll. Thank you very much for your participation. So we see basically here that um, the leader, so is business process automation, which is our second block today, uh, with 56% respondents, uh, followed by delivery channels and then product innovation, um, decision-making and sales through enhanced data management, where we have a special session in September, uh, has less importance, other also less, that looks like um, we are right with our topics today, and we will cover all the first three in this session today. So we can uh, remove this survey, that's fine, and we can start already now with the question one, where we'll ask all three speakers for a very short statement, and the question, stage setting question here is, how is digitalization changing the way products and services are designed? Is it changing it at all? Maybe everything stays the same. It's just a different instrument. Very short answers. We start from Charlene. Please, Charlene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. I, I would like to start quickly by differentiating between digitization and digitalization. These are two very closely associated things that are often used interchangeably, but to me, they're, they're two very different things. So digitization being the process of converting information from a physical format to a digital one, and digitalization being the process of leveraging digital technologies and data to convert business processes to be more efficient, productive, and profitable. Now, leveraging dig digitalization in product design and service design provides an opportunity to truly revolutionize the business. Digitalization enables businesses to adjust to meet the needs of behaviors of their customers who are living in this new digital age. And many of the FSPs that I've worked with actually have used digitalization as a way to reinvent themselves, introducing really a completely new business, uh, a new business model. Great, Charlene, thanks a lot. That sounds to me like it's a silver bullet. It's solving all the problems. Paul, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. And I just, I just kind of add to what Charlene said. I mean, traditionally, products were designed to fit into legacy systems and, and procedures. So if you've been around um, as, as long as I have, you, uh, you really understand um, the, the influence of legacy. Now with digital, I think it's the reverse and the customer really is at the, the forefront. So thus now it's possible to offer, let's say smaller amounts and reach more people, which really benefits the, the underbanked, the unbanked as products now can be developed thanks to thanks to digital in, in a more economical manner. Thanks, Paul. You speak about legacy. Um, we see a lot of fintechs coming up. They don't have a legacy, so they are faster. They are, can move much faster um, than uh, the legacy institutions. I just wonder, um, maybe the digitalization within the organizations um, uh, is just not going to give the results it should. Uh, it's all about Kind of letting the dinosaurs die and let new fintechs come up and take over. Dimitro, I'm sure you will not agree, but I'm provoking you with that question. What can you say about that? Uh, yeah, basically, two I questions believe, now. <laughs> yeah, I believe uh, digitalization is, is not a cause, but rather an effect. Uh, and I agree that the main driver is the demand side. So it's obvious that habits of customers have been. Uh, rapidly changing and uh, for example people are no longer willing to stand in line at the branch so instead of competition among banks based on price or branch location only the factor of service rapidity comes to the fore uh, and i can provide uh, an example of uh, what you probably called a uh, startup case yeah it's a mono bank in ukraine a completely branchless bank it was founded as a startup uh, in uh, 2017 and has grown its customer base to over 2 million clients including myself by the way or within the first two years. And uh, one of the main success factors was that Monobank offers all bank services, such as account opening, loan application, deposit, currency exchange, absolutely paperless, using one mobile app only. And by the way, if you uh, participants of the webinar, if you want to learn more about other winning factors or features of this particular case, please send us your questions and uh, I'll try to answer later uh, during or after the webinar. Thank you very much, Dimitro. So um, we all see 
digitization uh, on one hand for me it's not the magic bullet that can solve all of the problems but it's something um, everyone has to deal with in one or the other way and at the end of the day we want to uh, to see using this to make the clients um, more satisfied and bring better services to the clients that is uh, the main purpose so and that's the topic of the discussion today and we move to the first case study now which is uh, launching uh, an invoice supply chain financing app in Myanmar. Um, and that has been implemented, as I understand, Paul, um, under your guidance in a legacy institution. So, I mean, in a bank, not in a startup, as I understand. Uh, right. Paul, would you give us, please, um, a very quick wrap up uh, in a few minutes what this was about? And then uh, we can discuss a few questions around that. Yeah, sure. So let's just quickly uh, discuss the dynamics of, of the market. Some people might know Myanmar, some, some probably don't. So very much a developing market. Uh, most lending, if not all, was, was being uh, done, secured by, by real estate. And that was due to informality, um, poor financial information availability, uh, low financial literacy, weak contract law, um, et cetera, et cetera. So all similar kind of things that we see in, in developing markets. In turn, businesses would quickly hit a glass ceiling due to these collateral constraints. After all, there's only so much real estate that um, a business owner can, can, uh, can have. So really, we wanted to find a safe way with all those constraints that I just mentioned to start doing unsecured lending and, and, and do it faster. So we partnered with large um, FMCG, so fast moving consumer goods suppliers, who gave very tight credit and short credit terms to their suppliers. Um, FMCGs wanted to sell more and of course the suppliers wanted to buy more but pay later when typically they had converted these products into cash. Um, we started uh, therefore by financing uh, the payable side of, of the, the balance sheet. So the product design solved these larger issues that, that I've just described and I would say that this is a great example of legacy being improved through the use of, of digital. And, and why was that? Well, we were able to completely centralize our approach to manage the receipt and confirmation of invoices from, from the client. Legacy procedures meant that a customer would need to present the invoice in a branch. The branch in turn would send uh, the invoice after doing many checks on who signed the invoice, what color is the ink on the invoice, et cetera, et cetera, to the risk approval points uh, based in the center for processing. And a couple of days later, the client, the, later the client um, would receive the, the money. So this had an entire layer of bureaucracy and, and also delay. So the app or the digital element helped us remove um, all of this, allowing for direct submission of the invoice um, directly to the, to the processing team. More importantly, we had potential customers um, in areas where we didn't have branches. Uh, so meaning the, the branch option was, was simply not a, not a possibility. And also using digital, it allowed for mass or, or scale in a short period of time compared to the traditional route uh, to new business through branch and, and loan officer. So this all, all sounds very nice, but I, I think the most important thing here is, is the approach that we, that we took. We could have produced new procedures and risk policies which have needed approval from multiple stakeholders and the results somehow would have been a more diluted uh, product. For a product that we thought would work but were not sure, um, rather the bank's management supported us with an agile way of, of product development which allowed us to experiment. So a limit for the principle of the, the product was given. So i.e. a pool of money that we could, we could experiment with. And we were very much in a, in a sandbox environment where we uh, tested the simple procedures and, and policies uh, that we had, we had developed. And once we found that it worked, we produced the final policies and procedures which were then signed off by, by all the stakeholders. So for most banks, this would probably be the opposite way of, of doing things, but this really was the, the secret recipe to, to our success, I would suggest. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you mentioned about the sandbox uh, environment, basically. Who was all in that sandbox? Was the management also playing in the sandbox and what was their role at all in the project? 
Yeah, exactly. So um, perhaps sandbox is too a grand a, a term, but senior management at board level uh, gave us a uh, carte blanche um, authority to go and lend to these suppliers of certain FMs, FMCGs within certain constraints. So it wasn't like we had to go away and write procedures and policy and get them approved by everybody in, in, in maximum detail. It was, it was very kind of high level. This is the framework that you can, that you can move in. Please go, go and experiment and, and see if this works. Thanks, Paul. What would have happened if that went wrong? I mean, uh, it's like a little startup experience, what you did with the app, and uh, it wouldn't have produced the results. Um, what would have happened then? I mean, some dismissals maybe from the management or what was the no. culture in the institution? No, no, not at all. So uh, we had this pool of money. We, we had the outline. Um, worst thing that, that could have happened is that we, we we blew up this money and, and, and we lost it. But the, the whole structure of the product was designed in such a way that that really wasn't, wasn't possible. So the failures could have been that we didn't penetrate the FMCG suppliers uh, fast enough, or we didn't sign up enough customers, et cetera, et cetera. And we would have said, right, you know what, this, this doesn't work, let's, let's move on. Uh, but reality was, okay, these little things don't, don't function, let's fix them. Um, and let's carry on and, and, and try again. So it's the old cliche uh, kind of saying, if, if you're going to fail, if you're going to fail, then then fail fast. So yeah. it, it was very much that that culture. So you had fast moving consumer goods companies, FMGs, uh, FMCGs as partners, then um, uh, they were willing to have more sales, interested in more sales. The banks, uh, the bank wanted to have a, a reduced process and clients wanted to get access to more lending. Correct. That sounds to me like this can work in any country, in any market. I mean, you have worked in many markets. Would you agree with that? Or was it just a, a lucky case that the surrounding conditions in Myanmar where you did this, they were just uh, perfect for it? No, it, it, can, it can work in every market. I mean, each market has its own um, intricacies. The, the reason we were interested in doing it in Myanmar is because uh, un secured lending was really, really in, in, its, in, in the, the early days and we had to find a safe mechanism to, to do it. And, and this basically allowed us to do it, but, but for sure it can, it can work globally. Okay, Paul, we have a question directly to you. And um, I really like that question. How often um, uh, gets Yuma presented faked invoices? So let's speak a bit about the risks and the downsides of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, fake invoices weren't uh, an issue because we had um, the, the relationship secured with, with the FMCG and part of the process was when the invoice landed through the digital app in our, in our processing center, the uh, supplier was informed or the FMCG guy was informed that we would received this invoice and we validated it. So we, we would do that uh, initially through by, by telephone to, to the accounts department. And then later we, we automated it and did it through, through email. So that, that main risk was completely mitigated. Okay, good. Cost benefit, a few words about that. I mean, you sp six weeks is a short period, but still there was some effort to it. So, I mean, did it pay off for the bank? How did you assess at the management level the outcome? Yeah, so we, we weren't really per se looking at, at the cost versus uh, benefit. We were rather wanting to penetrate this segment and lend um, in, in this manner. However, using digital and not the traditional way, we were able to sign up uh, through uh, basically a two-person team sat in, in the head office around 50-odd suppliers in, in a matter of days. If you compared this to the traditional way of doing things through branches and, and loan officers, statistically, they, they could do two and a half, custom, uh, um, two and a half clients a, a month. So the impact was truly accelerated. So that, that was the, the main benefit. So very quickly, we could penetrate, very quickly, we could get the money out, and very quickly, we were obviously earning money on, on the interest. Okay, but you didn't have at the beginning for management set certain benchmarks where you say, if you don't reach these KPIs, then uh, we consider this is a failure. You didn't have that, right? Yes, we 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 had that um, a, a portfolio target that we thought we could reach within uh, within within six months, which 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 we did. It, it was it was quite conservative, and it was conservative because we'd never tried it. So it really was it really was an experiment. Yeah, I like uh, I like the word how you describe it at the end. Now it was an experiment, 
and uh, which means to me also experiments are there for trying things new out and some can fail others can't fail so exactly. probably it was important for uh, the overall implementation and acceptance of this that management says okay if it goes wrong no problem we try another one yes would you yep, subscribe exactly. yeah yep exactly that was it good at the end maybe one short statement uh, for any institutions uh, participating today what were the three key success factors you would say um, they should really look at when they want to make this work three points okay so again i'm, I'm going to re-emphasize that if uh, financial institutions and banks can really look at this as an experiment I mean, many companies have research and development budgets around the world, not necessarily heard of in, in banking, but I, I think this is the way you should, you should look at it. Here's, here's some money, we're gonna do an experiment, we're going to try. So really have that, that kind of culture. Uh, the overall carte blanche credit limit. So, okay, here's uh, $500,000, a million dollars, $200,000, uh, that doesn't really matter, but just a limit that you can, you can um, work in. And be very cognizant that the first launch, i.e., let's say the, the, the minimum viable product that, that you're, you're launching, is not going to be the final version. The amount of banks I've, I've worked in where they've, they've launched a, a product, and once it's launched, it's, it's set in stone. Um, and if it doesn't work, it's, it's a big failure and, and finger, uh, finger pointing uh, uh, begins. You really need to get away from that, and you really need to understand that this is a continuous development so the product is going to continue continue changing forever it's never going to be set in stone that that makes sense um we wanted to move on but uh quickly we take up two more questions so one from moldova is it safe to use the app safety of the app yeah i mean we we had lots of discussions around the the security etc cetera, etc cetera. the in simplistic terms, the app was a post box. It allowed an invoice to be remotely sent to us. So sure, somebody could get hold of the phone, they could make an invoice, they could, they could upload it. But at the back end, we had operational uh, controls. So this is where legacy really shouldn't be completely ignored, where we were validating what, what, we, were, what we were getting. So somebody couldn't just upload a, a bogus invoice and, and us disperse in the worst case if we did we were dispersing directly to the fmcg guy so it wasn't like um that the supplier could take the money and go to the casino it, it was all um under control thanks um and uh I, I allow myself two more quickly i think one answered you already how much time it took to test and to launch this application i think paul you said six weeks is that right yes yep okay thanks and then one more how to ensure that the borrower is creditworthy. Basically, everyone could walk in, buy a product, apply for financing. So you had to do this whole thing um, online. So very quickly, if you can. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, because we partnered with FMCGs, we had access to their supplier database. Then we set some criteria of people that we would like to, to deal with. So imagine if, if Michael had been dealing with um, Paul for the last 100 years and had been buying every month and repaying every every three months we had a kind of proxy uh, credit bureau there that, that we could that we could rely on and because we had this tight loop that you can kind of see in in the powerpoint slide there that 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 was also um under control so uh, just bear in mind in myanmar there was no credit bureau thank you very much paul for presenting and answering the questions on launching and voice supply chain chain financing up in myanmar with this we move on to question two and this question goes to Chalin. When and how do we select alternative delivery channels? You could speak probably for a long time, but you have only a minute or two. Please, Chalin. Uh, I probably can do it even quicker. So when, I would say only after defining the business objectives, conduct, conducting a market assessment, so the customer needs, operating environment, also the internal capacities assessment. And these would be key inputs to developing a, a channel strategy and a business case, proving out you know, what exactly you're trying to achieve with this um, alternative delivery channel concept. And then the delivery channel itself will really be determined by who the user is, what the use cases and operations perform would be, and of course, other factors that exist in the market. Um, to, to keep it short and simple, a good resource that I would recommend, which I see has already been shared in the chat earlier, would be the Alternative Delivery Channel and Technology Handbook that was published by IFC. This is a guide um, for FSPs that are 
embarking on their delivery channel or digitalization projects, and it helps them through the ADC selection implementation process. Great, Charlene. Thanks a lot. Uh, you can find all the information about uh, sources we mentioned, like the handbook, in the chat. Uh, thanks a lot. And with this, we come to an end of the first block. And for me, what stuck in my head basically was that um, the, the case Paul presented, I think the key factor was that they had a sandbox, a separate environment where they could experiment within the legacy institution with a lean way of going on with approvals um, on a general level, but then trying it out. And I think that is very similar to how a startup works. Good. So I think we answered all the questions we got on this section one. There are some other questions we will pick up later. And with this, with no further delay, we move on to block two. And the block two is starting with another poll question to you, my dear audience. What are the challenges you experience in attempts to redesign your legacy business process? So the challenges you experience when you redesign your legacy business process, you can select all of them if you want. And with, uh, while you were answering this, we can, uh, I would like to remind you also about the way how you can ask us questions. That's working very well this time. So the Q&A window, please ask your questions while this is being answered. <clears throat> and before we come to the case study two, we will in a minute close the survey. But we can answer a question. So let's pull up the question. What are the key success factors for the redesign of legacy business processes? Very short to each of you. Paul, if you can uh, take the start, please. I would say this can be summed up in, in one way, um, an understanding of why the legacy process existed in the, in the first place. What was the, the legacy process actually solving and, and why, and is it still relevant in, in 2020? Okay, thanks. That was short and punchy. Charlene? Yeah, I mean, very much um, agree with, with Paul in the sense that you shouldn't be afraid to, to challenge the status quo, right? I've seen many instances where FSPs try to replicate their legacy processes, essentially creating digital forms from what their previous processes were. And sometimes it actually really negates any potential aside from that initial wow factor of using a smartphone or a tablet to originate a loan. So the redesign should review legacy processes, of course, determine what's actually required um, and how the data could be captured more efficiently, what the customer experience and user experience would be, and, and really identify what can be automated and streamlined in terms of operations. One focus that I want to highlight is in, it, it is an opportunity to improve the quality and usability of the data that's going to support the business to make more informed decisions. So I would also highlight that as a, a key uh, success factor to that, that would contribute to this success. Thanks, Charlene. But is it really possible to uh, have the same people who designed the processes redesign them? So something is wrong with the processes and they are now redesigning them in a radical way to make them completely new. How is that possible? I would like to ask Dimitro that question uh, to Im implement this answer. Dimitro? Uh, yeah, uh, basically, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, mindset, uh, we say. So uh, it's clear, uh, rather than uh, uh, searching for uh, digitalization only uh, probably the the management or those uh, project managers that are who are uh, assigned to lead the uh, digitalization pro projects yeah uh, should more think and uh, even educate themselves on general change management I mean the, the culture of, uh, of uh, change yeah and uh, generally I would also capitalize on what has been said by uh, Paul and Charlene so not to overestimate the value of software, because uh, yeah, banks and MFI sometimes consider software to be a silver bullet for process efficiency and focus efforts on selection of, of software, for example. But after a while, they, they get dissatisfied with the effect because process design, I mean, the order of steps, roles, rules, etc., remains uh, mostly unchanged and the uh, high potential remains really un unlocked. So I recommend to begin with identification of what can be improved in the process without or before uh, software.
Thank you, Dimitro. So it sounds all like jumping into the water is not the right thing um, with the digital transformation. So that's exactly what we have seen um, at Yuma Bank. So I think still some, uh, some different perspectives on the same thing, but uh, very interesting now we end the polling uh, and we share the results with you. So um, look at this here, and I would like to ask Paul to uh, make a quick comment on that after I make mine here. So the, the second and the third, lack of understanding of purpose, approach and tools and lack of capital, capital staff members. That all points into the, the way how talent management is done, talent development, um, the human resources, take the people on board in the institution. I think we have said that in the first session, a strategy, we have a separate session on that next time, only on talent development in the digital age. So Paul, can you also give a quick comment uh, on this? I mean, you have seen, I think, uh, a lot of highs and lows in your career. I mean, does it sound reasonable to you or are you anyhow surprised by the results? Highs and lows is a good way to describe my career, Michael. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm not actually very surprised. So lack of capable staff members, uh, lack of understanding of the purpose, and then, then the regulator third. I would suggest there's a bit of an underlying theme here that banks can have the habit of working in silos so the product team will go away design what they think is the the best product go through all the waterfall process etc 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 and then right at the end they'll then decide to go and discuss this with with compliance and and surprise surprise compliance are not aligned and the the regulations of the market are also also against you so i think it's extremely important when a bank starts this process to get every single stakeholder in a room and discuss what you're doing and and why you're doing it and and for that to work you really need uh the mandate from uh i, I would say board level ceo that this is how we're going to to do it so then later um if problems come up because of lack of understanding of of, of people or or the perceived capability of 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 the people um it was made pretty clear to them at the beginning that you know this this shouldn't really be a a failure point so i think it's so important to involve all the people and explain what what you're trying to do and why at, at the beginning thank you very much paul and uh, I meant the ups and highs in your career of course the projects and not your career okay <laughs> um Good. Uh, case study two, we have to move on. And actually we um, have, have a bit running behind time. So Dimitro, you are great in making it short and punchy and to the point. The floor is yours to show about your experience in loan origination system implementation at Banca Intesa in Serbia. Dimitro. Yeah, uh, thank you, Marco. Please uh, move uh, to the next slide. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, basically many financial institutions still experience typical issues with legacy credit processes such as long and costly turnaround time, loss of data due to using paper or circulating soft copies by email, absence of any aggregated statistics on what's going on during various stages of the credit process, especially on branches. So uh, most of you clearly understand what a typical loan origination system developed to address those issues looks like like a separate software module that can be thought of as a pipe through which loan applications are processed while the system itself is a single window platform for all roles involved in the credit cycle, as well as for uh, potential integration with the various external internal databases to make loan applications more populated with data. So here on the slide, an example of master IPS is presented a system developed by BFC that has been installed since 2013 in financial institutions in three countries, namely uh, Georgia, uh, Rwanda, and Serbia. And uh, yeah, still a couple of projects are currently in progress. Uh, so all information about the features, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to focus on them, are available on the uh, product page. So please see the link, maps.beaconsulting.com. So I'll better tell a few words about one of the latest implementation cases. So please move uh, to the next slide now. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, Banca Intesa is the uh, largest bank by total assets in Serbia, and Master RPS for agricultural lending was installed and piloted there in 2017. So the legacy process they had before took more than 10 days on average. 
the turnaround time, I mean. So, and as a result of the project, uh, it was optimized significantly more than by half. Uh, but uh, BFC with the bank during the project were introducing small changes uh, step by step, including transition to uh, web-based workflow in parallel to uh, what we have discussed before, adjustments to the credit process design itself, such as rule-based application routing, changes in approval authority limits, uh, creation of a special farmer sales channel, etc. So as a result of piloting each change separately, we managed to measure the effect quite precisely. Uh, as a result, so reduction of time to cash by 53.6% uh, is a cumulative effect of all actions, out of which only 29% uh, is attributable to software and around 25% to other uh, process optimization measures. And as for the performance indicator, the column two, uh, we can't say that uh, yeah, the, the achieved annual portfolio growth is due to master APS only, because obviously the demand side also has impact on volumes of lending. But my point here is different. Uh, please don't uh, expect any sales growth from loan origination system itself by default, because huge efforts in this project were made by the head of his team uh, after the process optimization to utilize uh, the release time of, uh, of the front office staff properly to explore new sales channels, centralized lead management, incentive systems, etc. So, and finally, the, the qualitative effect uh, can be measured, cannot be measured in numbers uh, immediately, only after a portfolio of maturity. But, but what we can say for sure is that the bank now has in place a comprehensive database on customers, business, personal, agricultural, credit history data, etc. It's a strong asset that can be used for various purposes. Mm, for example, targeted marketing campaigns or statistical scoring development. And the, uh, to summarize on the mentioned above, uh, the uh, business process transformation does not consist of uh, digitalization only or new software only. So even more important are people in a driver's seat in charge of uh, piloting analysis and, and further continuous changes. Okay, thanks a lot, Dimitro. I have a few questions, and actually, I want to ask the first question to Charlene, uh, because uh, you were um, in charge of a of project at a software company, and I'm sure you did similar systems implementation here. So, yes. what Dimitro is saying, what I understand, you need to improve the business process first before you start developing technical requirements and implementing a software solution. So there are two things, the business process and the software solution, right? Correct. How did you do that uh, in your experience to deal with this? Was this just left to the client? They had to do it? Could they deal with it? Was it an issue at all? Or could you as a software provider help them with that? So you... from, from the role of a technology partner, uh, we did try to engage with our customers to understand, you know, from the beginning, what are we actually trying to achieve? And our goal was never to work directly with IT. When we engage with a customer from a software perspective, you want to engage with a business team. The business team is going to understand their business inside out. They, need, they understand the users, they understand the customer, and they're going to be really be able to define the scope of what they're trying to achieve. And, and so I, I think it's actually key that we, when we're talking about digitalization, we, say, we always say it's, it's not about technology, it's actually about people. And we would always you know, tell our customers, okay, we're going to bring you this, you know, we're going to, to configure this solution as, as you've defined, but you need to realize that there's a huge change management process that needs to happen. And you know, the technology partner, you know, we're providing them with a, a software license or you know, well, how, whatever, however it's packaged, but in many cases we would recommend to consultants if they didn't have the internal capacity to actually support with this change management management process um, and then it would have to be introduced together with the solution the the users would need to be onboarded with the technology with the new business processes on how it's going to be changed um, and what's so important is what Paul mentioned earlier is about engaging the stakeholders along the way so explaining to the, all the different stakeholders of how this is going to impact them how this is going to represent a change to their business and how the, the change is actually going to have a benefit for the the employees for the customers and of course for the business Thank you very much, Charlene. You both say basically that you have to have the business process redesigned, addressed when you do the new software, and there are different ways of doing it. Now, Dimitro, what are the key criteria to select the loan origination system? If I don't have one, how, how do I get there in a few words? 
uh, well, yeah, many criteria can be listed, but I try to point out maybe top three or four uh, based on our experience, not only with master PS, but in various cases. So first, uh, the most important thing to me is flexibility to make uh, custom changes. For example, adjustments in uh, workflows, forms, user rights, and so on, without the necessary involvement of the software vendor. In other words, when uh, like as much as possible can be customized quickly on the bank's admin level. Uh, it's especially important during crisis times, yeah, when uh, products, processes, uh, or demand side uh, is, is, is changing very rapidly. The second is a uh, pricing model. Some vendors can charge by the number of users or by number of processed applications or by outstanding portfolios. There are uh, a lot of pricing models in the market. So. The vendors consider it to be fair and okay. Now for me, uh, such options doesn't seem so, but uh, yeah, it's my opinion only, but uh, especially if a financial institution plans and expects business volumes to grow. So please pay attention to that. Uh, third, uh, cross-platform access, namely uh, having a, a, a desktop client and the version adapted for tablets or an app, a mobile app, yeah, better with offline mode available also. Okay, um, probably the last one, uh, probably other compatible modules that are available uh, on, on the vendor side. And if you don't need them, even you don't need them right away, such modules can be considered and acquired uh, uh, in the future so easily interconnected. Uh, for instance, like call center module or collection module, etc. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dimitro, if you had uh, only one question, you could ask a software provider. And let's imagine uh, Chalene, uh, Chalene is representing a software provider. Which one question would you ask her, basically, in order to decide if you want to engage further with her, basically, on, um, on the theme? You're representing a bank that wants to get a loan aggregation system. One question you would ask Chalene. And I want Chalene to know, basically, also what she will answer to that question, very short. Uh well, uh, on top of uh, what I already mentioned above, I, I would probably ask uh, the service provider the following. Do you have uh, experts from my industry in your team that will be involved in, in cooperation with my bank? Besides the great, all the great developers you have. Uh, so in our case, for instance, uh, do you have uh, former bankers with relevant track records uh, yeah, in, in your team that will be working with my organization. I, I hope it makes sense. Absolutely, I think it's a key question. And I think every software company who's focused on a specific um, you know, target market or sector, they, they should have that in-house knowledge and that in-house expertise. And they, yeah, I mean, in their, in their business team, who's actually helping define what the products are going to be and how they're going to work and how they're going to meet the business needs. I think what comes out of both your answers is, um, the eternal question of how the IT people can speak to the business people and you offer the solution of basically they should be mingled actually. Um, like um, we have it at BFC, for example, um, uh, with Dimitro being heavily involved in the development of a loan origination system itself. Of course, he didn't do the coding, but the technical task and was working with a software company um, to, to develop this uh, for us. Um, and the same like Charlene said, now in a software company you need um, actually credit people uh, to make sure they speak to each other in the language they understand. And um, um, I think uh, that's um, uh, already a good summary to this showcase. So if you want to know more, uh, please follow the link in the website or contact us directly about this. And with this, we come to the end of block two, actually. Well, if I look at my notes, basically what I'm seeing here uh, as a summary is about, we talked about loan origination or model implementation. Uh, what stuck in my head was again, um, it's not about technology. It's all about the people who run the technology, despite it's a technology project. And Charlene as a technology person is saying that that is something very serious. Uh, if a technology person says, well, my technology is less important than the people. And uh, that stuck in my head. The other thing is uh, customization and the flexibility of the software you are kind of getting. Probably the lack of flexibility of uh, existing solutions is one reason why so many institutions don't have it running. They bought a core banking system. They have a module in there, but it's kind of not being used 
because it's not flexible enough. So make sure you have the flexibility for the chosen solution. Great. We move on and we have to move on to block three right now with uh, another poll I would like to come up, which is the last and final poll today. Thank you for participating so actively in our polls. Which of the following stages in the innovation process do you find most challenging at your institution? So again, once more about challenges in the innovation process before we speak, or we actually can start speaking already about the, uh, with the question here, which points should be checked before launching a pilot. So I would like to call that question up to Charlene. And um, Charlene, if you can take that question for while yep. the poll is being completed. Charlene, I was watching the poll. I was very interested in the results. Um, right, so generally the checkpoints before launching a, a, a pilot, I would say even before planning the pilot, there needs to be a success criteria. What, what exactly um, do we consider a, a pilot, when do we consider a pilot to be successful? What are the KPIs? As you asked, asked Paul earlier about the case in Myanmar, what exactly were they, were they deeming successful um, for, for this initial launch of, of, of the solution and so, or the, or the product rather. Um, and so I would say that's actually key. And I think it's also fair to acknowledge that many pilots are, are really used for first engagements with a technology provider. And they're typically linked to payments or future phases, depending on the su success of the pilot. So it's, it's really vital to acknowledge, vital to ensure the expectations are aligned and well-defined from the beginning. And then this, the success criteria are going to be used at the end to really make a decision on, on, on where to go next. I mean, in terms of what needs to be addressed in terms of deficiencies that were identified or how, um, how to kind of introduce this based on the learnings that you, that you achieve in, in the pilot. Um, the, the real conditions for launching the pilot, I would say would be a satisfactory acceptance um, of the UAT, the user acceptance um, testing. Uh, a plan for onboarding. So how are you actually going to onboard um, your testing group? And of, of course, you need to identify what the testing group is going to be. So the testing group should not be the same as the quality assurance. It should be individuals who are not involved in the project and are reliable to provide constructive feedback. Um, in some cases, I've actually seen staff pilots or friend and family pilots um, be, be very successful because of the communication channels that exist there already. Thank you very much, Charlene. And uh, with this, we would like to close the poll and share it with the audience. Actually, I think um, I, I see a problem here. I have a problem. We have only 9% conducting a pilot project and seeing as a problem. So there's no problem conducting the pilot project. Instead, the problem is developing the concept for a pilot, getting management approval to go ahead, which seems to me there's a lack of sandbox approach, basically, because Management is heavily involved in, uh, in everything, probably. And the rollout is a problem. So Charlene, uh, you have the challenge now in your following showcase to kind of tweak around this um, uh, little unexpected outcome of the survey uh, that uh, you tried to answer. How actually did you go uh, about the concept development, getting the management approval? And I don't know if you can speak about the rollout. We can leave that for, uh, for the wrap up if we have some time still left. But we I don't mean, have so much time. Also, yeah. so please close your Charlene. Please go ahead. Okay, I think in terms of concept development, if I can just touch on that, I think Paul mentioned it earlier. It's it's you don't necessarily have to to even pilot your your final product or your final solution, right? It's it's many cases where you're just testing the minimum minimal viable product and just making sure that that is working for the user group. Um, that can even be a confirmation that. Um, you know, the absolute core features of the solution are working and then you can always develop and build on that. So I think sometimes the, you know, the, you may get challenges along the way and even actually the, the, the post pal, pal, um, pilot rollout um, would, you know, it, it would you may have challenges if you're trying to do something that's too big and too complex, like, you know, a big bang project, as opposed to introducing something that is, is quite simple and then adding complexities and more functionalities on based on the, the customer use and feedback. So I, I would start there um, and then um, maybe we can go start the case study in the interest of time. All right, let's move on with the case study. Thanks. Then we will have further questions on that. Sure. So, um, 
Right, so I'm going to, to be sharing a case study about Access Holdings' response to, to COVID uh, and a monitoring application that they developed. I, I will share that I wasn't in, intimately involved in this project, but I have been working with Access Holding for a number of years in my previous life, and I'm also uh, advising a technology company that's working with them currently. Um, so I, I have the insights in, in the relationships that still exist uh, today. But if you can please move on to the next slide. So when the COVID uh, crisis emerged, uh, Access Holding, as, as many other organizations, we needed to take action. Uh, and what they decided to do was create dedicated task forces to ensure the safety of their staff and customers, offer support to their customers in this uncertain time, and of, of course, ensure business continuity. It was quite timely that uh, their, one of their existing uh, technology partners, Juakali, approached them with a COVID response solution that would allow them to engage with customers in a safe and effective and supportive manner. Uh, and that could be launched quite quickly with a limited commitment. And so um, when, when they already had the trust relationship with Juakali and they already saw that there was a, a, a real need to, to be able to understand what uh, the status of their customers were. They decided to launch the project in, in May of 2020. Um, and the idea was to remotely engage with customers to get a sense of, of where they are, how they're being impacted, how their business is doing, um, and, and then be able to feed that back and make some decisions based on, uh, on the data. Uh, and I, I'm really excited to share that the first implementation for the first country in, in um, and, and Zambia actually went, or sorry, and Liberia went live in nine days, um, which I think is really impressive. And I'll, I'll explain how this works in the next slide. Good. Now, okay, so the solution works essentially by um, first, the back office staff is loading customer data into the app that each loan officer can access with their smartphones, such as client name, phone, business sector, location, and of course, installment details. And then Access Holding added some additional questions related to the business of the customers, the business open, impact on sales, the OPEX, whether they're at normal levels. And the client would have an opportunity to accept a grace period or to continue to service their loans. And in addition to these business question, questions, Access Holding used the opportunity to engage with their client around their health status, their family's health status, inform them about some basic hygiene, especially given in those markets that they were working, there, there may have been some different different information being shared and they wanted to make sure that they understood some of the basic hygiene rules uh, that was being shared um, at a global level. And then of course, using opportunities to inquire about their preferences in terms of digital channels, in terms of how they would like to be able to engage with a bank going forward because we don't know how long this crisis is going to last. Um, the data that they received from this process of, of calling in, in each of the, the customers and capturing that information, it was then assessed in a judgmental scoring model. And depending on the outcome, different predefined decisions were made or automated or manual actions were taken based on these business rules. And um, then the data is, is, is really used to guide the bank in terms of, okay, how, how are we going to perform during this time? They can you know, share that information with their stakeholders, with their investors to let them know what the, the status of their own um, assets will be in, in the, the near term. Um, the solution continues to run actually in Liberia and Zambia, and it's re the tool's reaching 60% of their customers in Liberia and 80% of their customers in Zambia. And um, I actually had a chance to follow up with some of, my, some of the, the team from Access Holding this week, and they shared that 40% of the customers in Zambia have chosen to reschedule their loan, and in, in Liberia, 60% of the customers who are engaged decided to reschedule their loans, and 97% of those are being repaid. Um, and then, of course, with the additional information that they, they've received, they have more visibility on their customers' businesses. So um, some additional information they share was 60%, 66% of the, the customers that they have are still, have still been operating throughout the crisis in Liberia. And 68% of that, uh, of those, were actually experiencing uh, at least half of their sales had been lost uh, or, or, you know, have, have yeah. They, they have a reduction in 50% of their sales due to the crisis. Um, so that gives them better understanding of exactly the impact on their customers and their portfolio. Another quite interesting benefit that I, that I learned um, 
was that access holding it feels that the solution is enabling them to really build the capacity of their their teams in the field for using digital solutions because before this actually Liberia and Zambia didn't have a, a solution being used in the field like a digital field application and so this is giving their giving their team that kind of first experience using digital technology um, and how it's connected with the with the information in the in the system in the core system and how they're able to uh, contribute to that and and decisions are being able to be made and in real time as they're getting the information so I, I think that's it's quite important because you, they have a digitalization strategy and the idea is that they are going to be able to grow the scope of operations using digital tools um, quicker because the capacity of their team is actually um, increasing during this time uh, and then um, just to kind of give a little bit more if you move to the next slide a little bit more details on Juakali they are a cloud platform that generates mobile apps um, and they are a startup that just started in 2019. Uh, and most of the mobile apps are actually supporting different use cases like loan application, customer onboarding, collection of savings and payments, customer engagement in agency banking. Um, I think this case study is a really good example of, of the successful collaboration to adjust quickly to operations, despite the fact that they didn't actually need or they, they didn't even have the time to, to perform a pilot uh, before bringing it to market. Thank you very much, Charlene. Uh, that was, uh, I think, a great case showing that uh, it is possible to do things, good things fast. And apparently, uh, you didn't have any issues with the concept uh, uh, development or uh, the management approval, as it was indicated by, uh, by some of the audience being an issue. So I think you had to full support uh, from the top level uh, for this when it was launched. Correct. Right. Yeah. The task force that was established, I mean, it was it was clearly a priority for the management team because the task force was established for business continuity and they needed to find a solution to be able to engage with their customers. So there was absolutely there was no challenge in getting management buy in. They, they also found this as a priority. And uh, in terms of the concept development, the key was to keep it simple. Right. I mean, what exactly are we trying to achieve? And, and then make it as simple as possible. And you can always, you know, Access Holding even said that after the first few campaigns, the first few weeks of campaigns, they started to adjust, you know, what questions were being asked based on the feedback that they were getting. So um, nothing is set in stone. And, and from the beginning, it just needs to meet the minimum of objectives. Nothing is set in stone. I like that uh, wording basically for, uh, for, for this way. We allow two quick answers on two questions and the others we will answer online after the webinar because we are running out of time. So Charlene, what percentage of the customers in Liberia and Zambia had smartphones to be able to use the app? Can you answer that? So the customers didn't use the app. The loan officers use the app and the loan officers, so all the loan officers then had smartphones and if they didn't, they were, they were of course provided with them. But I, I believe all the loan officers had smartphones and they were calling actually all the customers. So they, they would call and then they would get the information and then the way that any risk there was mitigated is then their manager would actually make the same call um, in some cases to confirm some of the information. So it didn't require customers to have a smartphone and in, in those markets, uh, it's not that the penetration of smartphones isn't extremely high. Great, one more question, quick answer to a complicated question, please. Can you please elaborate as to the boundary of individual judgment and QA based judgment in the solution? So the boundary between individual judgment and the key eye, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, I understand it. Um, Whoever asked that question, I would encourage them to either reach out to Juakali or, or Access Holding. I mean, each each uh, judgmental scoring model is going to be different and it's going to be customized, of course, by the uh, business and by their, you know, exactly scoring um, needs. So I would encourage uh, whoever asked that question to, to reach out to either the team at Access Holding and I'm happy to facilitate that if you want to reach out to me. Super, excellent. So Charlene, thanks a lot for the third showcase. So uh, dear audience, uh, dear co-speakers, we have to wrap it up. Uh, we learned in the first block from Paul that uh, understanding and addressing the, the key pain points of all stakeholders in the process uh, where um, external and internal stakeholders are there, the clients, the fast moving consumer companies, that is key to success. Everybody has to have a gain from that. Demetrius stressed that 
optimization of business process and software implementation starts and ends with the people and you have to be flexible. And now Charlene, uh, you said also that um, uh, speed is important in particular in uh, the response to COVID-19 where you presented your absolution here. Um, I found that was a very useful discussion uh, today we had and I would like to give a big thank to all the three speakers who prepared in their private time for this session and delivered the session. Thank you very much. Well done. My pleasure. Thank you. I don't know who's clapping else, but um, I think um, it's worth to give them a hand. Good. And with this, I also would like to thank our global audience for being with us again to joining us for the second session. And uh, a very big thank you to our BFC webinar support team who has been working for the last two weeks to make this happen. Thank you very much to the support team as well. And with this, I'm left just with an announcement of the next Ask BFC session, uh, which I would call up the final slide, you see. So we have made a small shift from the initial plan by talking about talent management, talent development in the digital age. 27th of August, exactly in two weeks from now, 10 a.m. Please join us again. Join BFC, ask BFC webinar sessions. Send us your questions in advance or during the session. I'm very glad we got so many questions. Those who couldn't answer, we have your names. We will answer them directly to you. With this, I wish you a good rest of the productive week or if you're on vacation, have a great vacation and don't get worried too much about the digital transformation of your business. It's not a magic thing. You can do it. Good luck. Bye-bye and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.